So welcome and good evening. Um, Robert Lever is coming to us this evening from Massachusetts. Hello. Hello there. Thank you very much for agreeing to, to meet with me to discuss both your work, your father's work, um, but also I should say the work that you feel has brought you and inspired you to this point in your life. Um, the first slide, obviously we can see on the screen now, selection of images. And these are all yours. Would you like to tell us a little bit about them? Yes. So um, I, um, I guess uh, the number one and number three are both prints. So they're um, made differently than the other ones. Um, and uh, uh, they are both monoprints. Um, and uh, they're monoprints in the sense that um, they're unique. Um, I am a, a sort of painter who does prints. And so the whole notion of addition seems really silly to me because it's like if you've done it once and you've spent a lot of time putting together um, a, a work of art, then why do you need to run it off on the copy machine? Uh, I'm not saying that, um, uh, that uh, high-end um, printing isn't really important and um, it's certainly not like a copy machine. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, what's interesting to me is that I tend to use um, a lot of different techniques. Um, if you look at number three, for example, um, there's woodcut there, there's linoleum block, there's um, offset lithography, there's also um, the uh, sort of old fashioned way of doing a mono print, which is that you put some um, uh, ink on a plate and transfer it. So a, a lot of things. What's kind of interesting about approaching it this way is it is does mirror the whole um, approach of uh, sort of making a, a painting, which is it's an additive process. And um, at a certain point, you've, you've moved things around and put them in place, and then you feel like you, you're done. Mm -hmm. uh, rather than working on, um, say, a plate over a period of time, you keep checking it, and, and then finally you have a matrix that you can uh, use to transfer the ink to the paper but many, many times. So um, what's nice about working this way, uh, just as um, uh, you would in a painting, is that things reveal themselves over time. So um, a lot of my work is about um, sort of uh, putting things down. Sometimes they get obscured, but what you realize is that they're still there and they affect the surface, even if you're not actually uh, wholly conscious of it. And part of that has to do with the notion that um, even though we call things like this two-dimensional art, they're actually three-dimensional because there are physical, there's the, the, the paint and the ink that gets put on the paper and that begins to build up. Um, certainly in a, in a painting, mm -hmm. uh, the paint can get very uh, thick. And because um, it's all about light, um, you know, you wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to appreciate this without light. The light um, uh, reflects off the, uh, the paper in this case. And uh, depending upon whatever pigment is there, um, it sends back information about the color. So um, sometimes the, the light tells us uh, that there is uh, a sort of physicality to the surface. Mm -hmm. And so you see shadows and things like that. And in fact, when we, we take a look at um, one of the artists that I've selected later, Elizabeth Murray. She has a really nice interplay between um, using the tools that representational artists use all the time to sort of create the sense of space, even though it's on a more or less two-dimensional plane, uh, mixed with some actual physical things that are going on. So that's, that's kind of quite nice. Where are you um, explained um, about very much about process now and surface. Um, what is the thing that's, um, what's the driver in making this, this, this kind of work where, where process, surface, application, you know, layers of material, materiality is very important, it seems, 
uh, in your work. Why is that, do you think? Um, well, I think uh, there's the notion of animating the surface of the paper. And so um, it's combined, I think, in my case, certainly with a, uh, a sense of whimsy. Um, I like um, to create uh, a world that might contain um, a number of different approaches. Um, but in the end, when you look at the finished piece, you say there's a wholly contained world there. Mm -hmm. And so everything is talking to each other. Everything is... Um, has a place, uh, even though you might say, like if you look at number four, there's some collage in there, there's some those bands of color up in the upper left-hand corner. Um, they don't really, uh, they're very different than the other kind of mark making that, that's going on there. Um, but in the end, it, it, um, it feels like it's a, an active participant in the world that's been created uh, within the four sides of the, the, the paper there. Is it, is it very important to you that the audience participates within that animation, within that movement? Or is it something that's actually about your desire to experience that surface? Oh, I think my work is a lot less about um, trying to convey something to somebody else. Um, you know, we live in a world where we're always, we're making compromises all over the place. And so the studio is a refuge, <laughs> so to speak. It's, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's a place where you don't need to make compromises and you can willfully make um, what might be considered mistakes in other situations just to see what it looks like. And, um, you know, I've often taken, you know, a piece of work that I don't think is um, working all that well and I've taken some scissors to it and I've tried to cut it in a different shape and sometimes at the end of it I'll go oh why did I do that and mm -hmm. then they end up in other pieces of work but I you know it's everything confidence to do that though I, I would imagine that you know I, I may have some of um, my students watching this and they may feel that they could never do that and that they could never in their mind perhaps destroy or deface something that they've become uh, maybe attached to or that is, is precious, even if it is in many ways unsuccessful as an image. How do you, how do you overcome that kind of preciousness about work and, and, and how do you move beyond that sense that we mustn't in any way change what has already happened in a piece of artwork? Oh, I think um, uh, one must always be an, uh, uh, a change agent. And uh, you use the word precious, and I think that's a, a perfect word. I've, I've often thought that um, that sort of holding on to things that appear to be working so well in some corner of your, you know, surface to be um, uh, the enemy of uh, a solution, you know. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes just getting rid of it is what can make the whole work move forward in a way. And, you know, it's... Um, I, I've um, uh, I, I've experienced it enough that you know I have I I look at a work and I say what's stopping this from going forward if it feels like nothing's happening, and usually you can say oh it's because I really like what's going on in that particular corner and you don't want to lose it I I once um, was in a situation where I. Um, was making art with other people. We, we decided that um, uh, there were three of us and we decided, we, we got together and we said, yeah, it'd be interesting. We'll, we'll all work on the same surface and we figured out what the rules would be or what we thought were the, the important rules, the size of the sheet of paper, which direction it went into. And what I found really liberating about this was that I was being asked to solve problems that I didn't invent. Mm -hmm. And so that was one thing that was kind of interesting. It's like, oh, I would never have done that. Now, how do I make that work on this piece of paper? But the flip side was that I thought it's also an opportunity to throw bombs or to sort of shake up the next person um, because I know what 
they're used to doing, you know, trying to get them to confront something that was unique. What ended up happening is that one of the people passed me this, uh, the paper, um, and I think we'd been, uh, I think it was a mixture of printmaking and painting on this paper. And she let me know and know on certain terms that there was a part of it that she just loved. <laughs> so I thought, okay, I'm not going to get rid of it, but I'm going to completely change the nature of what it is. Mm -hmm. So um, there is nothing um, that is in a vacuum uh, on a piece of paper. Everything around it affects it. Um, and so that's what I did. I can't remember exactly what I did, but I made it so that it was operating differently on the paper than it did when she loved it. Mm. And the next thing I know, she, she, I knew she had actually liberated her part of it. And I go, oh, we didn't even talk about, you know, what are the goals here um, in this, this whole project? And uh, it was actually quite shocking to me that, that she did that because she essentially destroyed what I had done mm. and left her, her work, you know, uh, visible. So... It's so interesting what you're saying. I, uh, in fact, people who know me very well will know that when I was at school, I used to get really irritated by my art teacher constantly telling me, Sandy, art cannot exist in a vacuum. And uh, also that one of the, I think, defining moments of my own art education was actually in my, I think my first, certainly my first week at art college, being in the studio and making what I felt was rather a beautiful um, drawing of um, natural form, uh, twigs, mm -hmm. a tree, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were all standing around at easels doing this and then we were told stop and we were essentially torn from our work and told to move clockwise around the room and go to the next easel along. And that kind of strange experience of thinking, well, because we were also very new students and new to each other, we didn't know each other very well. Here was I, uh, probably very arrogant about my abilities as somebody who could draw and uh, had been, you know, having a look around to see what other people had been doing and was quite satisfied that I had done a fantastic drawing. And then here we were being taken away from what we'd done. And again, that sense of preciousness, which is why I think I, I'm very sympathetic to my students when they feel precious about yep. their work. And then the next person along had to deface it. Um, or more uh, in your line of thinking, a, a sense of adding to it in a way that made them feel that it was complete. And of course, then we kept doing that over and over until eventually we'd gone around the whole group and we came back to our original easel. And there was this, at first, what appeared to be an abomination yeah. <laughs> um, actually turned out to be a really beautiful, quite inspiring piece of art in its own right. It didn't belong to anyone or it belonged to everyone. That's a lovely way of putting it. That's a beautiful way of putting it. And actually, funnily enough, when I uh, was putting together my slides and I looked at uh, number five, yep. there's many things about number five that also reminded me of that process because everything was in charcoal and graphite, it was black and white. And also for me, when I was putting the slide together, I found it interesting that you would select four color images and then put a fifth one in like this and in our preamble for people who are watching robert explained to me that actually funnily enough this particular image is actually smaller than all the others could you tell us specifically anything about number five yes it was um part of a series of drawings that i did <clears throat> um sometimes the my studio would get sort of um let's see, uh, filled up with stuff, <laughs> you know, paint left out and, you know, and in order to really sort of keep moving along, sometimes you'd have to do a major cleanup. And I just did a whole series of these uh, pen and ink drawings. Um, there's also some pencil in there. And actually what um, I think, uh, I have a few things to say about this. The, one of the things people, I think, don't realize is what a physical um, process it is to, to actually make art. 
Um, and, uh, you know, it, whether it's painting or whether it's, it's drawing, you're moving your arms around. And um, what you can't really, I think, appreciate here, but if you look in sort of the middle of that, you'll see some lines. Um, those are actually pencil marks that go into the paper. And if you see it, it's physical, you know. Um, but again, it's sort of um, uh, part of what I was interested in exploring um, is sort of the presence of the obscured um, so that uh, there are things that contribute to the final um, uh, sort of uh, view of the work. Um, uh, that are not necessarily apparent, but if they weren't there, it would be a completely different work. Mm. Um, so, uh, but also the absence of things. You know, I love the idea of the presence of the obscured, but there's an absence. I mean, we could, uh, you know, very basically say there's an absence of color, but does that create a, a, a new language? It gives it another narrative and would totally change the nature. Well, I don't know about the, the color part. Um, I think, you know, just because it's in um, sort of gradations of, of black, I, I tend to see there's color there anyway. Um, uh, what was I gonna say? There was something I wanted to add to this. Oh, um, one of the things too that I'm really interested in is the sort of nature of, um, the the things that are first put on and then the different layers that are added it's also about time because mm -hmm. there's a, a sort of travel from the surface of the paper out to the the front and we tend to think of time as sort of linear but here it's all represented in one kind of uh surface so um that's kind of interesting to me too so. hmm. When we look at these, I wonder um, to get a size of scale just for a minute. For example, well, number one, you know, how, how big would the thing be in reality? Um, well, I would probably express it in inches for that work for you. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. <laughs> um, that one is probably about uh, 24 inches wide. Okay. And um, the same uh, with the one below. The, the, the black that you're seeing there is actually not part of the print. It's what it was photographed on. <clears throat> um, and, and then the other, the number two is, um, oh, that's probably about 14, 13 inches wide. Number four mm -hmm. is, uh, um, actually the smallest of the bunch. I'm guessing that's maybe about nine inches wide. But they're still quite sizable pieces, you know, they're not. Um, a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of learning artists at the beginning of their art journey are, may, it's not laziness, I think it's just, um, again, lack of confidence. They would work with standardized sizes of A5 and A4 and A3 and so on. So these are, you know, the kind of standard sizes of, of paper even that's available. Well, actually the um, one and three, the prints, they're actually standard pieces of, um, I think it was mulberry paper I used for that. So it, what's kind of nice about that is that it's, um, it's not perfectly uh, square, <laughs> which I love. <laughs> and it also has a surface that absorbs the ink in a kind of interesting way. Mm. Um, and uh, so when you see these, actually those two prints in person, um, that once the ink gets transferred on there, the light actually reacts differently depending upon where you are. Um, uh, on the on the surface. So when you see the paper, it's sort of a matte kind of thing. There's no light bouncing off of it. But if you look at number three, you see sort of the red squiggles towards the middle bottom area. Um, that uh, actually looks shiny a little bit just mm -hmm. because of the, the thickness of the ink that I used there. Mm -hmm. 
would you say that you've had a very uh, long, uh, deeply interested relationship with color? Oh yes, absolutely. You know, um, uh, you mentioned that, uh, I think you've mentioned, but maybe not yet, that my father was a, a, a painter and um, he uh, actually studied with um, Joseph Albers uh, at Yale and got his famous color course. And um, I took a year off before I went to college and um, I had him give me the course. So <laughs> if, um, if you know what it's about, or if you don't know what it's about rather, it's, um, it's uh, you have something called color aid paper, which comes in a box. It's silk screen paper, all these different um, uh, shades of all the different colors. And uh, that's one of your tools. Rubber cement's another one of your tools. And another one is an X-Acto knife um, so that you can cut up the paper. And basically you're given problems. Um, uh, and it's a perfect example of something I mentioned before, which is nothing exists in a vacuum. So, um, you know, color is not ever by itself. Um, what comes around it um, will profoundly affect your understanding and reading of what the color is. So the color, say, in the middle um, of maybe um, uh, a painting or whatever, can look totally different depending upon what it is that you you surround it with. Mm -hmm. And so... Because um, I know that Albers, uh, I, I suppose they must have been contemporaries with Johannes Itten, thinking about colour and form and, and those kinds of courses and, and bookworks, especially for, for artists who couldn't access um, time in a college setting. Um, and for you to be taught in a year out at home by your dad, who had actually been taught by Albers, um, I think is quite extraordinary. You can see on the screen here for people watching, I have changed the slide and we can see now um, a couple of examples. Um, Robert Jr., who's also Robert Sr., which gets very confusing. <laughs> <laughs> this is your dad's work. Yes. Yes, it is. And uh, he, um, uh, he had uh, a very, uh, I think, good, good training, um, uh, Beaux-Arts kind of training originally, but also had the, um, you know, did the, the color course with the Alberts. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, at, you know, he, he uh, had a long career, but he did actually die rather young. He was younger than I am now when he mm -hmm. passed away from a heart attack. But he had um, before then started on a whole series of images that were based on a dream about um, uh, terrorists attacking Memorial Stadium. So um, Memorial Stadium is the giant football stadium at the University of Texas in Austin. And my father was a big football fan. And uh, uh, what's just, just amazing to me is that, you know, we're talking about late 80s. And this was before the word terrorist was a daily word, you know. And he just had, I, you know, I have a whole, I have other paintings in my house. I have prints. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, it's just amazing that he had this vision that in some ways, um, echoes what we're living through now for the first time. So, um, but anyway, that spawned a whole set of paintings and prints. Um, you, you see other images, uh, not here, obviously, but, um, sort of close-ups. Uh, there was one series, a, a lithograph he did called Fans in the Stands. And they're all kind of going crazy with a, a dirigible up in the air and smoke. And then I've got other, I've got some small intaglio prints that um, they're, uh, you know, sort of dancing terrace with gas masks on and things like that. So Do you very... think having a, having a father who's an artist is, um, well, it could go one of two ways, I suppose. Either the child of an artist becomes an artist themselves or they completely react against it. How did it feel becoming an artist when you knew that art 
was so much part of your family already? Well, um, you know, my, my mother also <laughs> um, uh, paints. Um, she does watercolors. Um, I, I guess um, I have a number of uh, sort of reactions to that. One is um, it makes you understand um, um, sort of the whole world of art making in a completely different world um, than if you grew up where it wasn't um, a thing of value. So I got taken to museums often. I was at the dinner table with other artists, hearing conversations. And so it seemed like, uh, well, one um, very quickly acquired a language to talk about um, uh, uh, work. Um, and I was always surrounded by um, sometimes, um, well, not only my father's finished works, but sometimes you'd see incomplete works. He had a studio, you know, in the house. And, and so it was um, something that, you know, one could see as a career, you know? I, mm -hmm. I've heard so many stories about, you know, parents going, oh, well, you know, you'll go to art school and then go ahead and get a real job, you know? <laughs> <laughs> or, or yet still you hear, uh, well, don't go to art school because that's just a giant waste of time. What would you ever need right. for? Right. And uh, we don't want to spend the money <laughs> for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, there, there's also the aspect of, um, I guess, feeling um, that how do you live up to somebody uh, who, whose work you respect a lot? Mm -hmm. And um, how do you see them as judging what you're doing? Because it's rather different, you know? But did you, I mean, when you had conversations with your dad about your work, as I'm going to assume you did, what did he feed back to you about your work? For example, some of the work we can see on the earlier slide, you know, did he... Um, saw ever, none of that. Saw none of this. No, um, there's a, a few things. Um, one is, um, I, we lived very far apart in two ends of the country. So he lived in Texas uh, with my mother and, uh, you know, um, well, uh, my wife and I have lived in Peru and um, uh, Spain and different places. And in some of those places, I wasn't even making work because I was sort of trying to sort of do other things and starting a family and um, understanding my obligations uh, in that department. So um, I would say that, um, you know, it was sort of an off and on again thing about making art. Uh, it wasn't consistent until much, you know, much later. Um, well, one of the things that I found really interesting was um, sort of uncovering a cache of work I had done during college and uh, discovering that the language that I was using in my paintings was a more developed version of what I had been doing years and years before. So it's like over time, when you look at artwork, you know, um, and you become familiar with lots of different painters, and I find this a lot with musicians, I'm a huge music fan, big jazz fan, um, you can hear in like a, a beginning of a sax solo or you can look at a painting and you go up, oh, I know exactly who that is. Mm -hmm. And so it was really kind of really nice to see that there was a language that was um, sort of unique to me that I had developed that was still operating as a, a good tool for expression. So, um, but, but also what was nice was that I, saw that I was using it more in a more sophisticated way than I had in college. So I do love the idea that we've got these kind of visual signatures that um, we we do refine over time, but they've kind of always been present within us. They are always there and they can move and, and change and grow, but they they don't they don't ever leave us if they're with us. Yes, and what's kind of nice about a lifetime uh, is that you um, often aren't quite 
um, keyed into uh, where that comes from. Mm. But over time, you begin to understand it by sort of exercising that muscle uh, and uh, using it and pushing it around and turning it upside down and, you know, all of that to, to make work. So. Well, you've also been kind enough, apart from sharing your own work and your father's work, you've selected for me five additional pieces. Um, before we start talking about this one, in our preamble, before I pushed record, um, you did say something that I think would be true for most thoughtful people, is that actually the, the five images that one might pick vary depending on obviously what stage in life one is, but also even maybe the mood of a particular day of being asked. That there's such a, a, it's not fickleness, but a sense that even what we believe to have inspired us has its own movement. Yes, I mean, it's, it's interesting that you say that. I'm, I'm prone to deep dives sometimes, um, particularly in music. And uh, um, I don't know if, it, I would imagine that it's available in England, but the Steve McQueen. Uh, five movies, small acts. Has that been shown? No, uh, I know. Streaming. Um, so the the second one is called Rock, which is you know a genre of, of reggae music, and uh, it's just this wonderful. Uh, it's it's about you know um, in the seventies, um, but it's about sort of a party coming together and then. Um, the party takes off with the music and there's dancing, but it feels like you're engaged in real time. It isn't like in a movie where you get like five minutes and then there's other things that go on. It is the thing. Yeah. And um, the music, um, I, I uh, used to listen to a lot of reggae and I haven't that much lately. And I go, oh, yes, I forgot. I like that music. And so I've been kind of doing a deep dive into exploring that. But, um, but let me tell you about this, this poster here. Um, I grew up at a time when um, psych posters were sort of coming into their own. And uh, this is a poster, I grew up in Austin, Texas, and this is a poster for a place called the Vulcan Gas Company. Vulcan Gas Company existed maybe for a couple of years. Um, and uh, what was kind of interesting about it uh, is that there was no alcohol served there. They wanted minors to be able to come to the concerts. And uh, what I just love about the poster uh, is the, um, the, the, the color thing that's going on. And uh, it's, you know, I use the phrase animating the surface. This is a perfect example of this. Um, mm -hmm. Even though it's physically flat because it's ink on paper, um, it's uh, it's just just so wonderful in the way it's you know shimmering. Another thing that I really enjoy about this, um, and it's it may have sort of presaged my interest in typography, is that you see the type changing as it mm -hmm. moves through on the on the page. So you've got some rather formal letter forms and uh, at the beginning sometimes and then all of a sudden they become much more ornate and sort of follow their own path and so i just really love this the one of the things that um i don't know if you know how this is accomplished but there is um on this probably only uh three different um colors uh or rather ink fonts so what they would do is they would put one color at one side of the um, uh, the roller uh, uh, pan, and then put another, and that they would blend together. Mm -hmm. And so over, you know, when they printed it out, that's how they got this these nice, wonderful gradations here. I th I think when I look at it, it it does actually seem very, uh, there's a musicality, the sound I see really. And that is to do with the, the lettering and the lettering kind of morphing and changing. It's very conversational, it's very friendly poster. Um, 
Yeah. Yes, the, the guy who actually designed it um, was, um, uh, he became very famous for uh, underground comics. Um, he, um, he's the one who created Wonder Warthog and the fabulous Furry Freak Brothers and uh, <laughs> uh, Freddy the Cat. So um, he also, um, I, my father took me to this place once. I went there a couple of times. Um, and the the man, Gilbert Shelton, who did this, um, apparently was running the light show. So I got to go up. And uh, if you've ever seen how that works, they have these overhead projectors with um, watch glass or uh, clock faces, you know, the glass. Mm. And they put water and food coloring in it. And then they put another one on it. And they're able to sort of push yeah. it and make it pulse with the, the music. Yeah. So kind of interesting. I do, I mean, I, I don't want to skip ahead, but I'm going to, I'm sorry, because I'm just going to take us into light installation. Okay. Mm. So James Terrell um, uh, uses light as his medium. Um, and this looks like it's a three-dimensional object, but it's um, actually just a really strong projector that's, um, I don't quite know how he uh, shapes the the um, the edges there, but I've seen enough of his work to know that he has a lot of control over that. Mm -hmm. And when you're in a room like this, it has a real physical presence. It's just light being shown into um, a corner of the room. He's, he's got um, um, a whole series of pieces he's done in various parts of the world where he, um, creates these sort of inside chambers and then gives you a, a view into the sky for mm. you know the light and and the light changes but it's almost like putting a frame around it I suppose um, which kind of reminds me of this Yoko Ono piece I saw once um, mm. at a museum here which was it was a screen on the wall and all you saw were these clouds kind of going by and I go, what's that and she had a camera on the roof that was just pointed up. I thought that was wonderful. I, I do think this is an interesting link though, even back to the Gilbert Shelton poster, because of this, um, the illusory nature of kind of spatiality, there's something about entering a space, like the poster, as you said, is a flat medium, it's a flat, yep. flat surface. But maybe because of that, uh, the, the gradual change in color into the background, there's definitely a, a sense of receding away or of arriving up upon a space behind those letters. And then just to think about this as a, as a projection, kind of playing with our sense of layers of space as well. You do that very much in the work we've seen of yours. Um, is there a relationship between your work explicitly and, and this kind of thing where you've taken away a sense no, of diversity? No, not, not, of not at all. Um, um I think you know we're we're human beings in a world with sort of multiple interests, and sometimes we're drawn to work, I think, on the basis of what um, the kind you know uh, uh, all of those interests put together, and we discover somebody after we've been sort of doing something that might seem related. Okay. Um, but no. Um, actually, uh, I'm trying to think when I first became aware of him. I know that maybe eight years ago, um, I went to the Guggenheim Museum. He'd taken it over in New York. And um, if you've never been there, it's a Frank Lloyd Wright building that's sort of a spiral that gets, you know, uh, smaller. Uh, in fact, it's, it can be a little disconcerting because when you're looking at things on the wall, the, the floor is, you know, often just a little off. Yeah. But what he did was he put lights and closed off a good portion of it so that um, when you looked up, you would see the lights slightly changing over time. Yeah. Um, in fact, there were people just lying on the floor, including my son and I. <laughs> <laughs> that reminds me of the Olafar Eliasson uh, installation at Tate Modern. Was that with the fog? And there was the fog, there was also the sun rising. 
Mm. Um, it's just extraordinary. People lying for hours on end in the turbine hall, flat on their backs, yes. completely um, serene. Yes. Uh, and I may, you know, it's sort of like should be prescribed, I think, for <laughs> for people. Yes. Um, go and go and go and look at a light installation somewhere and see how you feel. Um, I know I'm skipping ahead, but I will come back to these other ones. Yep. I just want to show this at this juncture as well because now we're talking about um, illusions of space. And well, we're talking shape. about a lot of things here. And, uh, <laughs> yes. um, I'm just going to show this because you sent yeah. me the moving image. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it does give an excellent flavor of what this is Before actually. Before you run it, yeah. um, maybe I should just tell, ex explain what it is. And then we can, after we show it, we can talk about, um, well, talk about another <laughs> version of what it is. But um, this is 48 different movies in, in a single projection overlaid on top of each other, running at the same time. They're different lengths. So, over time, like there's no, probably no single moment in front of this thing that um, you would actually have all the, the, the same um, uh, movies keyed up in the same way, but they're um, overlaid on top of each other in diminishing uh, rectangles. So um, this was shown, I saw this at the Venice Biennale last year, uh, large uh, dark room, big uh, screen, not, like in one of those, you know, newer movie theaters with the tiny thing. This is a huge, big black room. And all of the sounds from these 48 movies being projected, uh, going on at the same time. So a huge cacophony. I'm not sure my, um, my little uh, phone movie captured the sound, but anyway. Uh, Will we watch it? Yeah. Okay. My phone probably protected itself by, you know, lowering down the sound. But um, I think there's something incredibly postmodern about what we're doing. Actually, we're watching something that was watching something that is watching something before. It's really uh, layers of us even observing and watching in this. I'm gonna go on to the the, the still version so we can see it. Sort okay. Of straight yep. on. So, uh, yeah, sort of experientially for you, was this heavy going? Was this hard? I loved it from the get go. I, I just, um, uh, what I loved about it was that um, I was seeing the edges of things. And as I thought about it, it, it became, it's sort of like the way we go through uh, life. You know, we're not always catching the full moment or the full understanding, but um, particularly um, these days with sort of um, communication going so fast and just, you know, people's attentions, we're, we're getting sometimes just the liminal edge mm. and um, how, uh, you know, it, uh, I don't know. It just it just seemed so wonderful that it, you know it kept changing because it was also about the relationships of all these movies, and you didn't have to know what was going on in in any of the movies to sort of see this as sort of um, sometimes a way we go through through life. So um, when we think though about it being a uh, forty eight war movies. Was there a yes. sense in the room, I'm, I'm just trying to get a, a feel for this, was there a sense of the kind of horror of war, like the cacophony of noise you described, this um, vortex space in which you kind of, you're sucked into it, you're sucked into war. Uh, that's why I wondered if it was actually quite a challenging thing to, much as you might have loved it, it that perhaps there was an element of it being quite uh, violent, actually. Well, we don't really, um... What's interesting is we don't see the violence, we just mm -hmm. feel the violence. And that part of it is the, the, the constant movement and mm -hmm. light that's changing around here and the really loud noise. Mm -hmm. That's all of these. And what's interesting is that, um, 
occasionally you might see, um, you know, uh, uh, in one of those bands, you might see a face and say, oh, that's a person. Yeah. He's got a helmet on or whatever. Um, and then in the um, sort of cacophony of sound, sometimes you, you might hear actually a voice stand out and then it's back to <laughs> kind of like that. So um, it, it's, uh, I, I don't know, I just really thought it was you know, even more than about war, it's about sort of living life in a society where there's so much going on constantly, where there's so, we're bombarded by sense, you know, sensory information. Would you say that going back to your work again, just going to reverse, hang on, going back to your work, you know, are we bombarded? Are, are we bombarded by? I don't by think so. Um, I think um, the, the whimsicality is sort of an invitation to take a turn on the dance floor, so to speak. Um, at least I hope so. I mean, it's a... Uh, um, Yeah, I, um, yeah, I don't, actually, I don't see these as, as bombardments at all. Um, and they, maybe that's, that, maybe they, that's because I've, I've sort of, um, <laughs> run naked through the landscape, so to speak, of my own, you know, <laughs> paper. I've been, I've been, you know, every, you know, on every spot I've, I've spent time, so. Mm. But would you would you say that these are quiet images or are they loud images? Um, I can read them both ways, actually. Mm. Um, I I suppose the number two is is um, um, uh, be a bit loud. Mm. Um, but uh, I don't know, you know, the, the thing that's really important to, to note here, we're, we're looking at um, a, uh, um, a slideshow and then we're showing it on a monitor here. And that's not the art. You know, we mistake sometimes these images that get thrown up in dark halls on sl with slide machine, you know, uh, uh, slide projectors and, um, that you're missing so much, you know, it, it's like you flattened it all out. I had a, a friend once when um, computers started becoming ubiquitous and, and, and good printers were around. He said, oh, you should, um, you should, you should do that. You, you know, you'd really like that. And I said, no, I don't think I would because I like the physical interaction and I like the resulting work, which is physical. And uh, when it's flat, um, we are, when it's on um, uh, a screen here, we don't know the scale. Mm. We, we don't know um, if the color is correct. You know, in my uh, years as a graphic designer, um, having to communicate with somebody about, um, you know, uh, the, the color of things over the web and having people look at, that's too pink, I, and I'm saying, well, it's actually not to, um, your monitor looks different than mine because everyone looks different. And so um, while this does look pretty good on my screen here, um, I have no idea what you're seeing in some sense. I mean, do you see a place, uh, like a digital place for your work ever? Well, um, uh, public. Um, I, I know that I did fool around with it a little bit and I, I made some uh, digital prints and then I ran them through a regular press <laughs> with stuff on top of it um, just because I like throwing the kitchen sink at things. Um, <laughs> it's interesting also for me because I'm looking at a collection of, of, of artworks that um, the thread running through them of course is, is you, you're the person who selected them. But there could also be a sense of them being completely disparate. There's, you know, what is there a golden thread in all of this? I mean, that's why actually I chose to go from uh, the Terrell um, into the video installation 
come back to your work. Um, it's not the order I had expected uh, this to, to follow in, but mm -hmm. um, it's well, funny how, you know, kind of for me in, try, in terms of trying to understand somebody else's practice and somebody else's inspiration, I suppose I'm looking for patterns in how others are seeing the world. Um, but I'm not sure, I'm not sure you've supported that theory actually. There's so much going yes, on. Yes, um, I think um, one of the things that I've attempted to celebrate here with my selection is that there's a lot of different ways about being in the world mm. and that um, I sometimes appreciate people who are completely different than what I am. Yeah. And I'm glad to be surrounded by that variety. And um, it's inspiring that, you know, uh, each one of us is capable of bringing to the table um, uh, a unique vision. And um, that unique vision is not just about um, the language that we talked about, the sort of visual language. It's also about the materials that one uses. Mm -hmm. It's also about the way somebody handles the materials. It's about the size of the work. Um, and uh, it's also, um, what's interesting is, I think I mentioned this in some email to you uh, that you, know, you were asking me to select individual images and i was saying how at this stage of my life i tend to think of um i look at this painting for example by philip gustin and um then i'm thinking about all his other work that i know mm -hmm. and it's within a context and one of the things that i appreciate about it is that this painting is not an anomaly it's a unique painting that has um uh, an incredible, for me anyway, uh, uh, beauty um, because of a lot of the things here. Um, uh, but it's not like any of his other paintings, even though it's like all of his other, not all of his other paintings, but his, the, of the, this stage. So, um, you know, what, what I look for is, you know, it's, it's not like um, somebody has a hit on the radio and then the record company says okay we want the next one to sound like that because it was a hit and we want to sell more records you know it's like if it sounds just like the other one then what's the point you know it's like keep making new work but be true to your own um uh, language and your own uh vision and um that's what keeps it interesting mm -hmm. does that make sense yeah I, it's um I'm trying to think about it in context of what we were saying about the kind of visual signatures ha having a having a sense of one's own art, the inner artist, and then how that becomes a variety, a very wide variety of different methods and outcomes. Well, for this this guy, he started out. He was originally Canadian. Um, and he came to the U.S. and studied art. I think he might have even been at uh, the Otis Art Institute when Jackson Pollock was there. I believe that's right. Um, but he made a lot of work that was um, originally, it was um, sort of uh, social realism. It was uh, about commenting on, um, uh, on, on uh, certain uh, realities. In this country, there was... Um, something called the Works Project Administration during the Depression. Mm. And uh, the government ended up hiring all kinds of people to sort of keep them working, uh, including a lot of artists. And so they would paint uh, in um, post offices and you know uh, federal buildings and things like that. And he did some of that. He also went down to Mexico and um, worked uh, on doing some murals down there and became friends with Siqueiros and Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo and all those folks. Mm -hmm. um, and then he, he in the, uh, I guess, um, the, the 50s, he started painting, he became something of an abstract expressionist. And um, you saw the way he handled the paint um, change a little bit. The, uh, he had a really you might look at this and say, oh, what a um, sort of simplistic uh, notion of color. 
but it not not at all. Mm -hmm. um, but it does come out of the way he was sort of pushing paint around um, as an abstract expressionist. And then he realized he wanted to um, actually uh, have to 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 real things, and he took a long look at himself. He, I think, suffered from depression, and, and um, he just spent lots of time in his studio. In fact, he was um, castigated for having made the switch to, you know, what by his uh, fellow artists because they were all painting abstract paintings. And, you know, you know what's this, <laughs> you know? And um, I just love the way he moves the paint around. Um, and that, um, one of the things that you see here uh, as what looks like an unfinished painting mm -hmm. is actually, no, it's, that's a decision, you know, what <laughs> um, there, uh, you know, sometimes people look at paintings and say, oh, that looks like a mistake or look, there's a drip there, you know, and um, maybe that's not a good thing. It's, it's not a good thing. Um, if you don't want it to be there, but if you decide to leave it there, then it's a good thing. <laughs> I mean, coming from the perspective of the artist. So, so um, I just thought, I found him to be really um, uh, uh, brave uh, and uh, just uh, loved the way he jumps in and, and he like pushes that paint around and uh, he, he has a, a unique style. I would actually, um, really suggest uh, looking at this guy. There was a, I think I mentioned this maybe before, um, that uh, there was supposed to be um, a traveling exhibit. Um, one of the stops would be at the Tate, certainly here in Massachusetts at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts and a couple of other places that was, because of some of the subject matter, they found it was a little too, um, um, I don't know, I thought, it was it'd be hard to present. So um, hopefully that'll get um, rescheduled sometime soon because he's just a, an incredible, honest painter, I think. So. I, I do wonder about this rebelliousness, um, a rebelliousness in terms of expectation. Uh, do you think you, you seek to kind of defy, defy some kind of prior, codification or the rules of art through what you make and also through what you enjoy when you see things? Well, um, I, I think if you want to um, work within a certain set of rules, then you've got to sort of establish where you, um, what, what place you occupy within those rules. Um, and, uh, you know, if you're occupying a place where somebody's already placed their chair, then it's, um, it, why bother? You know, I've seen a lot of art over the years um, and it's just not art with a capital A, you know? It's like, okay, I see that you put paint on a canvas and I see there's a nice flower there. And you know what? I've seen that painting a million times by a lot of other people. Mm -hmm. So um, it, if uh, I, I don't think I'm, I mean, I, don't, you want, don't you want to see something new all the time? Don't you want to, I mean, I mean I, as I mentioned before, I'm a big music fan and my motto is, if I haven't heard it, I have to hear it, you know? And uh, so I listen to music from all, all over the world. And I love going to live music, but um, this particular work, I studied with this woman, um, Elizabeth Murray. And when I was studying with her, she was making uh, square canvases with these um, shapes that have been almost shoehorned into um, uh, the surface, uh, sort of with these kind of dissecting curly lines. What I really love about this um, piece and a lot of her other work um, is that there's, um, well, there's a lot of things I like. Let me, let me start by saying there, 
are some things going on in this painting which are illusionistic. In other words, it's paint on a relatively flat surface and you are reading it as um, something that's three-dimensional. Mm -hmm. And then there's the real three-dimensional stuff that's going on, which is almost like um, a flat thing exploding at the same time. And I love the fact that she said, you know, why does a, a painting need to be square? Mm -hmm. In fact, why does a painting need to be more or less flat? Um, I just love her whimsy. Um, and I know I've used that word a lot, and, and certainly um, when I think about my own work. Yeah, I just, in the context of your own work. I, I, do you think that this kind of work has had perhaps the biggest stylistic impact on your own art practice now? You, you know, I, I'm, again, I'm going to just go back to your work and think about a lot of these I, I'm sorry if I'm being well, too sick. The kind of sense of color and form. There's, is there a kind of allegiance to something that Elizabeth Murray? Well, I, I think um, there is, um, in my work, there's sort of an energy that's connected with the drawing aspect. And I think here she's actually taken that the the sort of desire for energy and um she's um sort of exploded the the surface um but it's a very different kind of drawing um it does again take us into a space though like we enter a we enter a different sense of space maybe with this yes we do and if you were in front of this painting, um, you could be in many spaces at once, which mm. is kind of what I, I really like. I mean, there's references here to cubism and everything else, but it's almost sort of like, you know, a joke. <laughs> it's kind of fun. It's like, oh, okay, so we can look at, um, you know, all these different sides of an object at the same time. Well, let's poke your eye out. <laughs> mm. <laughs> you know? No, uh, notions of simultaneity, we can see though, again, in, in this work, the Markley stuff, um, there's, a, there's an element of simultaneity in Terrell's work, I'm sure. I've never, I've never actually seen any of Terrell's installations in person. I know that he had a, a lot of work in, uh, I think in Cornwall for a while, a, 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 an ongoing installation. Um, but I suspect that, that being with this work, it's very much about appreciating the illusion of depth and, and space. Well, also, it's, um, it almost inspires a kind of quiet, like mm -hmm. you're in this room, and it's always nicer when there are fewer people in the room, um, because some people have a tendency to go up and try to poke it. <laughs> um, but uh, it's it kind of, um, I don't know. I, I was once in a, a sensory deprivation tank. And uh, one of the things that I found <laughs> so wonderful about it is that, you know, you get into this thing and there's water in there and there's a lot of salt, so you, you're floating, right? And I was in there for about an hour and um, you know, my wife goes, wow, wasn't that really claustrophobic? Because it's really a very, not a very big thing. But you go in there and it's totally dark. You're floating and you're so relaxed. And all of a sudden, there are no walls. Mm. You know, you're just in a space that's infinite. Mm. And I suppose there's something about some of Terrell's work that sort of inspires that kind of connection to something that's so much larger than the moment or or even the, the space that you're currently in, so. Well, Robert Levers, I could speak to you for a lot longer, but I'm afraid we've <laughs> run out of time. Thank you well, very much. Well, thanks for Richard. getting in touch with me. I, I uh, loved, uh, I love this. Well, thank you for sharing your work. Thank you for sharing your dad's work. And thank you for sharing all these other artists' work. I'm sure there are many artists in this presentation 
that for certainly some of my students, they'll be fresh to, it'll be new to them. Um, and I hope everybody at home can appreciate quite how um, beautiful and also timely, I suppose, this work actually is. Um, so Robert Leavers, I will say once again, thank you very much for joining us and I hope to speak to you again. Yeah, the pleasure is mine.